Upside down thoughts refer to any of the thoughts worldly people have. The function of the Sura Gama Sutra is to destroy and melt away these inverted, bloated thoughts and to dispel our subtle delusions. Subtle delusions may be so subtle that the eyes can't see them, the ears can't hear them, and the mind cannot form thoughts about them. As soon as we give rise to one unenlightened thought, the three subtle delusions arise. Although the space of a thought is very short, delusion can be likened to dust. If there is dust flying about in a room where there is a mirror, the mirror will immediately catch a lot of dust particles. These particles of dust will go unnoticed until they come so thick that they cloud the mirror. Our subtle delusions are like the dust on the mirror. Fundamentally, our own nature is like a bright mirror. It is the great perfect mirror wisdom. But because of the production of these fine delusions, the bright mirror becomes coated and grows dimmer and dimmer. Great, great Master Shen Xiu's verse says, The body is a body tree. The mind like a bright mirror stand. Time and again brush it clean and let no dust alight. Some people say this verse is incorrect. I say it is correct. Why? He's telling us to constantly cultivate, to time and again brush clean the mind so that it doesn't catch any dust. Brush it morning and night for when you have cleared up the dust of the subtle delusions, the mirror of your nature will shine brightly. Before one has become enlightened, one should honor this doctrine and cultivate in accord with it. The great master, the sixth patriarch, said in reply, Originally, body has no tree. The bright mirror has no stand. Originally, there is not a single thing. Where can the dust alight? This verse was spoken by one who was already enlightened. One who is enlightened can understand and cultivate in accord with this verse. It is said, when not one thought arises, the entire substance manifests. When the six roots suddenly move, one is covered by clouds. When not one thought is produced, the Buddha nature and Samadhi appear. When your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind suddenly move and take control, it is as if the sky has suddenly clouded over. So, one must put an end to inverted false thoughts and dispel the subtle doubts and then one can, quick, can very quickly realize Buddhahood. Unfortunately, though, no one wants to realize Buddhahood. People would rather flow along in the five turbidities, flowing along and forgetting to return. They take suffering as bliss, turn their backs on enlightenment and unite with defiling objects. Although they have not ended birth and death, they nonetheless think themselves pretty fine, saying, Look at me, I'm intelligent and handsome. Everyone who sees me likes me, and I understand what others don't. Actually, such people are just like mirrors attracting dust. The more dust that gathers, the dimmer the mirror gets until it reflects no light at all. They may think themselves smart in this present life, present life, but wait and see, perhaps 10 lives from now they will end up as stupid as pigs. Therefore, in this life, we must decide where we will be going. We must recognize clearly what our destiny will be, what path we will take. Then there is hope. The sixth reason the Buddha spoke this sutra is to clarify the two doors for the benefit of living beings of the present and future. The two doors are the Dharma door of level equality, which is the actual Dharma, and the expedient door, which is the provisional Dharma. Provisional Dharma is not real, but is temporary and impermanent. Actual Dharma is real and forever unchanging. There are two Dharmas, provisional and actual. The expedient Dharma, which is the provisional Dharma, may be illustrated by the following event. 
Once Shakyamuni Buddha saw a child toddling toward a well. A child was on the brink of falling into the water and would surely drown before anyone could reach it. The Buddha knew that if he called to the child and come back, that it wouldn't listen but could, would keep right on running. He said instead, I have candy in my hand, come back quickly and I will give my candy to you. When the child heard there was candy to eat, it turned around and came back. Actually, there wasn't anything in the Buddha's hand. But was the Buddha lying? Was he cheating the child? No. The child was just about to fall into the well. If the Buddha hadn't enticed it in such a way as to cause it to turn immediately, it would have drowned. It would have drowned. The Buddha extended his empty fist and said there was candy in it. The child came because it wanted to eat candy. The provisional Dharma door is used to teach and transform living beings. Basically, there isn't anything at all. But the Buddha says to living beings, I have treasures. Come to me and I will give you a jewel, a priceless gem, and other fine things. Because living beings are greedy, they follow along to reap the advantages. Ultimately, they have been enticed by an expedient Dharma door. The provisional Dharma then refers to the clever skill it means is to save living beings. The Dharma door of level equality, the actual Dharma and the provisional Dharma door were both used in speaking this sutra. By means of these two Dharma doors, living beings are led to separate themselves from suffering and to obtain bliss so that they eventually may give proof to the results and realize Buddhahood. The two doors benefit living beings of the present and future. The present here can refer to the time when the Buddha taught and it can also refer to now. Living beings of the present and future can obtain the benefit of being enriched by the Dharma. To make the two doors understood for the benefit of living beings of the present and future is the last of the six reasons for the arising of the teaching. The division in which the sutra is included and the vehicle to which it belongs. The division and the vihigo. The division refers to the Tripitaka, the three treasuries of the Buddhist canon, the Sutra treasury, the Vinaya treasury, and the Shastra treasury. The three treasuries correspond to the three non outflow studies, precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. The Sutra treasury teaches samadhi, the Vinaya treasury teaches precepts and the Shastra treasury teaches wisdom. In sutras, one often sees the title Tripitaka Master. This refers to one who has mastered all three treasuries. Although sutras may include sections dealing with the Vinaya or with wisdom, they predominantly deal with the study of Samadhi. For instance, the Suragama Sutra teaches people how to cultivate dhyana concentration. This has already been mentioned as the fourth reason that the Buddha spoke this sutra. To display the samadhi of the nature and to exhort us to actual accomplishment. There is one section in this sutra known as the four unanswerable aspects of purity and this is an explanation of Vinaya. But since the sutra is primarily devoted to a discussion of samadhi, it is not classed as vinaya, but as a sutra. The vihaiko refers to the two vihaikos in Buddhism, the great vihaiko Mahayana and the small vihaiko Theravada. The small vihaiko is like a very small cart, which can only seat a few people. It is the vihaiko of the South Hearers and Pratika Buddhas. The Great Vihaiko is the Bodhisattva Vihaiko that is like a limousine which can seat many people. This sutra expounds Great Vihaiko Dharma for teaching Bodhisattvas. 
of whom the Buddhas are protective and mindful. As instruction for Bodhisattvas, it causes our hearts to turn from the small and go toward the great to resolve their minds on Bodhi and cultivate the Bodhisattva way. For instance, when Ananda returned from the house of Mantaji's daughter to where Shakyamuni Buddha was, he respectfully requested the Buddha to instruct him in the path to Bodhi which all thus come ones of the past have cultivated. Shakyamuni Buddha's answer to his question is the Suragama Sutra, a Dharma cultivated by Bodhisattvas. Therefore, this sutra is classed as a great vehicle rather than a small vehicle dharma. The depth of the meaning and principle to which of the teachings do the principles discussed in the sutra belong? The Tianta school describes the following four teachings. The storehouse teaching, the connecting teaching, the separate teaching, the perfect teaching. The storehouse teaching or Chibitaka teaching refers to the dharmas of the small vehicle. It includes the Abhidharma and the Agama Sutras. Agama is sometimes interpreted as incomparable dharma, but even so, it is still the teachings of the small vehicle. The connecting teaching connects with the storehouse teaching that precedes it and with a separate teaching that follows it. The separate teaching differs from what comes before and after it. It is not the same as the connecting teaching that precedes it, nor the perfect teaching that follows. The fourth of the teaching as described by the Tianta is the perfect teaching. Of these four, the Suragama Sutra belongs to the separate teaching. The central school makes five divisions, the small teaching, the beginning teaching, the final teaching, the sudden teaching, the perfect teaching. The small teaching coincides with the storehouse teaching of the Tianta division. The beginning teaching includes both the connecting and the separate teachings of the Tianta. The final sudden and perfect teachings are all contained in the perfect teaching division of the Tiantai. Although the names differ, the principles are the same. The small teaching refers to the small vehicle teachings. The beginning teaching refers to the beginning of the great vehicle teaching. It was spoken for those who understood only the emptiness of pupil and had not yet realized the emptiness of dharmas. They were not yet free of their attachment to dharmas. The final teaching is the great vehicle dharma. It is for those who understand the emptiness of pupil and the emptiness of dharmas. The doctrine of the great vehicle, speaking of the emptiness of pupil and dharmas, I am reminded of a story that is on the public record. When Shakyamuni Buddha lived in the world, people often asked him to accept vegetarian meal offerings. Following the meal, it was customary for the host to go before the Buddha, bow and request Dharma. If the Buddha was not present, then the host would ask the Buddha's disciples to accept the offering and in turn, the disciples would speak Dharma for the host. One day, the Buddha and his great bishops left the Jata Grove of the city of Sravasti where they were living and went out to accept an offering of food, leaving behind only one small Ramanura, novice monk, to watch the door. After the Buddha had departed, an Upasaka layman came to the monastery to request that a member of the Sangha come and accept offerings at his home on behalf of the Tripajura. Finding that the bishops and the Buddha had all gone out, he said to the one small Sramanura who is left, That's okay, I invite you, Sramanura, to come and accept my offering. Come with me. The small Sramanura nervously consented to accompany him, nervous because he had never gone out by himself to accept an offering before. He'd always gone with the other bishops. Once he found himself a obligated to speak drama, he realized he didn't have any idea what to say. 
Also, this concern weighed on him. He accompanied the host who had so sincerely asked him to go and accept the meal offering. After they had eaten, the inevitable happened. The host very respectfully turned to the small Shramanara, bowed deeply and requested Dharma. As an expression of his sincerity, the host kept his head bowed as he knelt before the small Shramanara, waiting for him to speak Dharma. Then, said the small Shramanara staring at his host prostrate before him. And then what do you suppose happened? Without uttering a word, he slid off his chair, tiptoed outside, and beat a hasty retreat back to the Jetta Grove. Naturally, he felt ashamed at having eaten his fill and then run away without speaking the Dharma. For a long time, the host knelt, with his head bow bowed. But finally, having heard nothing, he lifted his head to steal a peek, and he saw that there was no one in the seat before him. The small Shramanara had disappeared. At the moment he saw that the Shramanara was gone, he became enlightened. He awoke to the emptiness of pupil and the emptiness of dramas. Ha! Ah, so that's the way it is, he exclaimed, and wished immediately to seek certification of his enlightenment. Naturally, he headed for the Jetan Grove in search of the small Shramanara. Meanwhile, the small Shramanara, petrified that his heart would pursue him in quest of the drama, had run back to the Jetan Grove, headed straight from his room, slammed the door, and locked himself in. Who would have guessed that not long after he had locked the door, he would hear a knock. The little Shramanara stood frozen with fear without making a sound on the other side of the door. He was totally panic-stricken. After all, he had eaten the host food and now the host had came demanding the drama. His nervousness reached such an extreme that at the height of his anxiety, suddenly he became enlightened and also awakened to the emptiness of pupil and the emptiness of dramas. This story illustrates that it is not certain under what circumstances one will become enlightened. Perhaps you will become enlightened by getting nervous, or perhaps happiness will cause you to become enlightened. Any experience you stumble on may bring enlightenment. Some hear the sound of the wind and become enlightened. Some listen to the flow of water and become enlightened. Some become enlightened upon hearing a wind drum. Others upon hearing a bell ring. I have heard all those things many times. Why haven't I become enlightened? You may ask. How should I know why you haven't become enlightened? You must wait for enlightenment until your time arrives just as you must wait for food to be cooked before you can eat it. You must wait for the opportunity to repent. When the opportunities are ripe, then anything you run into can cause you to become enlightened. The patriarchs of the past in China have become enlightened under many different circumstances. It is only necessary that you continue to cultivate and investigate the Buddha Dharma with determined and concentrated effort. If you do that, then one day you will become enlightened. If you are already enlightened, so much the better. If you aren't enlightened, you should go slowly and wait. Don't be nervous, don't be so anxious that you can't sleep or eat. The final teaching is for those who have awakened to the emptiness of pupil and dharmas. It is the entrance into the great vehicle teaching. The final teaching instructs bodhisattvas. It is not, however, the ultimate teaching. It is to pass by the sudden and perfect teachings. The perfect teaching explains the unobstructed perfect interpenetration of all things. Everything is originally the Buddha. The Dharma Flower Sutra, a perfect teaching, says that all living beings will become Buddhas in the future. That sutra says, if people who are very scattered and confused enter a stupa or temple and say Namo Buddha but once, 
they can all realize the Buddha's way. When people enter stupas or temples to bow to the Buddha, they should be sincere and intent upon what they are doing. But here, the Dhamma Flower Sutra refers to an insincere person who enters a temple and casually recites Namo Buddha. Due to just that one recitation of Namo Buddha, he will become a Buddha in the future. I am reminded of another story that is a matter of public record. When you recite the Buddha's name, you should transfer the merit to all living beings. You shouldn't just recite for your own sake. When you recite the name of a Buddha even once and dedicate the merit and virtue from your recitation to all living beings, you thereby increase the merit and virtue of the recitation and you make it penetrate without obstruction. Once Shakyuni Buddha went to a certain country to collect alms accompanied by all of his disciples except Mahamudgalya Yana, only to find that no one there would give them offerings. Neither the king nor his government officials nor the citizens made offerings to the Buddha or his disciples. Later, however, when Mahamudgalayana arrived in that country, there was a complete change of heart. The king, the officials, and all the citizens very respectfully gathered around to welcome Mahamudgalayana to, and to bow to him. They beseeched him to let them know what he needed so they could make offerings to him. The Buddha's disciples did not understand why the Buddha, one of such great virtue, received no offerings from the people of this country, while when the Buddha's disciple arrived, the whole town turned out to greet him and everyone made offerings to him. What's the meaning of this? The disciples asked the Buddha. The Buddha told his disciples, the great officials and the citizens made no offerings to me because in the past life, I failed to set up conditions with them and consequently, we have no affinity with one another. Once long, long ago, ages prior to this one, Mahama Udgalyayana was a firewood gatherer. One day, while picking up firewood, he bumped against a nest of bees and they swam out to attack him. Mahama Udgalyayana simply recited the Buddha's name and made a vow saying, Namo Buddha, you bees, don't sting me. In the future, when I have realized the way, you will be the first ones I take across to Buddhahood. Renounce your evil thoughts and stop harming people. As a result of this vow, the bees did not sting him. Eventually, the queen bee became the king of this country and the drones and workers became the officials and citizens. When Mahamawud Gadhyayana now, a bhikshu came to this city, the former bees whom he had to take across all bowed and welcomed him. Such is the power of his former vow. Taking this situation to heart, we should always establish wholesome affinities by being kind to everyone. We should vow to lead all people and all creatures to Buddhahood. A vow is invisible. But living beings have the equivalent of a radio receiver and their minds, so they can tune in to it. A vow is not tangible or visible, but beings will instinctively know if you are good to them. You should resolve to rescue all living beings. Anyone who maintains this frame of mind will have affinities wherever he goes. I went to a certain place and no one came to my aid. Why was that? Someone may ask, it is because you didn't develop any affinities with the people there in the past. Creating affinities is especially important for cultivators of the way. So it is said, if you haven't harvested the fruit of body, first create affinities with living beings. How? By being good to everyone. Why is this necessary? Living beings are the Buddha. Being good to them is simply being good to the Buddha. If you are not good to them, you are not being good to the Buddha. 
Every thought ought to arise for the sake of living beings. Every good deed should be done for the sake of all living beings. One should use all one's strength to do good deeds, such as the resolve of a great vehicle bodhisattva. Don't be a small vehicle self ending a heart who only takes himself across to enlightenment and doesn't take others across too. If you can see all living beings as Buddhas, living beings will see you as a Buddha. If you see all living beings as demon kings, living beings will see you as demon king. It's just like putting colored glasses on. If you put on green glasses, everything you see is green. If you wear red glasses, everyone turns red. Not only that, but the way you see others is the way they see you. That's why I said earlier that living beings have radio receivers in their minds which let them tune into each other. Don't think the other person is not aware of your bad thoughts. Although he may not actually know what you're thinking, his self-nature senses it. Being good to people is yang light, not being good to people is yin shadow. The meanings and doctrines of the Suragama Sutra are as deep as the sea. Although some people claim to have fathomed the depths of the ocean, actually its depth varies so much from place to place that it's impossible to say just how deep it is. The doctrines of the Suragama Sutra are the same way. It's not easy to fathom them. Each person gains his or her, or her own particular advantages from the Sutra. From person to person, the advantages differ, but all come forth from the wisdom of the Sutra. Because the Sutra is deep, the wisdom we can obtain from it is great, and the Samadhi power we gain is durable. So it is called the ultimate durability of all things. If each of us obtains something from the Sutra, are its meanings and doctrines diminished? No, the meanings and doctrines are like water in the sea. When someone goes to the shore and dips out a bucket full of water, the amount of water left in the sea is still great. If another person takes some water for his purposes, the water in the sea is still abundant. The sea is inexhaustible and unending. The doctrines of this sutra are also inexhaustible and unending. When you become enlightened, the sutra's doctrines are still as complete as they were before your enlightenment. You can extract any amount of wisdom, but the wisdom obtainable from the sutra remains the same. It neither grows nor diminishes.